Now we arrive at the house where a fair number of island lifers have squatted and slept and lived over the past ten years. At the moment, Pietro, Jesus, Tipitina, Marcia, Sarah, Javier, and Marcus the dog, Pedro, who sleeps in the closet on a cot, occasional Quentin, Rolf, Swan, Alexis, Crackers, Mancini, Sarah, a statuesque R&B singer for the band called In Memory of Sister Rosetta Tharp, Pa Rump, Bonkers, Wicked Wup, and Johnny Cash, and sometimes Snuffles Johnson the Bum, who sleeps on the porch, call this place home. It's a one-bedroom cottage, but because of the high rents in the area, no one can afford to pay that alone, so they all live together here. Phoebrus, the messenger hamster for island life, has his enlarged habitat installation, which runs from the backyard through the washroom, past the bathroom where it takes a dip in there over a bucket of wood chips, and then out along the hall and into the front living room and back again. Marlene and Andre occupy the 6x8 bedroom as principal leaseholders with Mr. Howitzer, the homeowner. Marlene used to work as a bicycle messenger in the city, but now she pieces together hours behind the counter of the Slut Hut Coffee House on Park Street. She cashiers at Pagano's Hardware and the Webster Pharmacy, and provides occasional vocals for Andre's rock band, No Future in Real Estate. All these folks live together, sometimes in shifts because the greed of landlords has caused local rents to rise so high no normal human beings can afford them. So housemates and roommates have become de facto realities in the Bay Area. Occasional Quentin is called by that name, for he occasionally sleeps under the coffee table when not camping out on the beach. What can one say about occasional Quentin? Well, occasional Quentin occasionally collects spare change by panhandling, scavenging trash, and occasionally playing the drums for the band called the Monkey Spankers. Occasional Quentin, however, is always a brainless ninny. This is his chief characteristic. If the Schlemiel is the man who always spills the soup, and the schlamozzle is the man on whom the soup is always spilled, occasional Quentin has managed in his character to combine the two, both the schlemiel and the schlamozzle. For if he were to collect a bowl of soup and try to carry it across the room, inevitably he would spill it on himself. He does, however, possess a very good heart, and that is what counts. Swan, one of the few housemates who he is gainfully employed, helps out whenever the rent is short any particular month. She works in the fine trade of exotic dancer at the Crazy Horse Saloon in the city. The folks in the household, much like the people of California, all come from different places. Mancini was born and raised in Oakland, as was Xavier and Fibris. Quentin comes from San Francisco. Parump hails from the reservation near Pyramid Lake, Nevada. Jesus and Jose come from Mexico City. Marcia from New Jersey and Tipitina from Metairie in Louisiana. Pietro comes from Nicaragua. All of them have their stories too long to tell here, so folks will just have to look into the 10 years of stories section on the website and learn all about Mancini and the building of Interstate I-580 over his father's house, about Marcia and the sand dollars, and about how Rolf, born in the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, was flung over the electrified border fence as his family fled to the west, how he scrapped to survive in West Berlin after his father had died, and his mother mysteriously disappeared from his side on the Speebrücke. Mutti! Mutti! Wo bist du denn da hingehauen? Bist du lass mich nicht allein? Bitte, bitte lass mich nicht hier allein! and how he came to America years later by means of a passport found in a stolen wallet and splashed through the retaining pond at SFO escaping the cops and so became in San Francisco the first Teutonic wetback and now works as a barker for an emporium similar to the place where Swan also works. Oh, come everybody in. Perhaps the girls. You like very much. Shop, what ice? 
home now and have good times rolling. Haba haba. Naked. The girls are of them. The plus on. Maybe some shoes, but else? Nothing, nothing, nothing. That very exciting. Hey, the guy that walk to. Come on. Make the feely hoppy hoppy. Yes, too many stories to tell right now. So let's move on down the road to more upscale diggings. Of course, not all the island lives under such social and economic um, peculiarities. The other half, so to speak, much like America in general, lives rather comfortably. Usually folks like Mr. Howitzer live up on a hill in other towns. However, since the island is proud to announce a maximum elevation of some three feet, we have no hills, so we divide the social strata into west and east. Marlene and Andre's people are definitely West Enders. We now come to the part of the island where the well-to-do maintain their well-kept lawns and well-preserved lifestyles on estates worth quite a lot of money. Here reside the hoity-toity of the hoi polloi the financial wizards, the successful stockbrokers, computer industry wonks, software engineers, a few lawyers and a few doctors among them. There, in the middle of Grand Street, the shining jewel of high society lives among them. Yes, here lives the inventor of something many of you have found indispensable over the years, a valuable product which no home of means should be without. The Roach Clip Mr. Howitzer, although living on Grand Street, the unofficial demarcation line between two very different worlds, is most definitely a solid East Ender. As are all of his intimate associates, which include Mr. and Mrs. Cribbage, the Dowdy family, and the Umbridges of Kensington. Most of these folks got their money the old-fashioned way, they either inherited all of it or they stole it from either the Ohlone Indian villages or former Mexican citizens. A few, like Mr. Howitzer, got their money by means of real estate speculation and land development, also a form of theft, albeit sanctioned by the government, which Mr. Howitzer despises. His family got its start in California when Uriah Howitzer arrived from Vermont to sell shovels made of cottonwood to miners before settling in the town of Brooklyn by the Bay on land owned, as they thought, by the Peralta family. The ownership of that land sort of vaporized when Uriah, assisting Horace Carpentier to become the first mayor of Oakland in a landside election that saw Horace win over his opponents by some 9,000 votes, even though only 8,000 souls were registered to vote there. On land supposedly also owned by the Peraltas, as the town of Brooklyn got absorbed by Oakland, all the Fruitvale and Brookfield areas now belonged suddenly to Uriah, who had children by several wives, starting a dynasty that dealt comfortably with Crocker and Huntington, bought up oil rights from unsuspecting farmers, created water corporations, and curried profitable relationships with, with folks like Boss Ruff and Gustav Ubsen in San Francisco, making pots of money all the way until a very large 1941 airplane factory deal with a company called Mitsubishi and a really big prepaid import order from Krupp Steel. Things sort of went downhill for the family after that. Now the last of the Howitzer line runs a minor real estate development business and lives in a big mansion on Grand Street with his dog Eisenhower attended by his manservant, assistant, gopher, and footpad Dodd, who arranges parties, caters events, tends bar, supervises house repairs and improvements when he cannot do the plumbing, and fixes problems of all kinds, including the safe removal of the pig named Ermano, 
who had been intended as the main course for a particular luau that did not go well a few weeks ago. Raccoons raided the festivities that evening, and Hermano, well, he survived to grunt and wallow another day. It is from Mr. Howard, sir, that Marlene and Andre rent their one-bedroom cottage down along the bay shore.